uh, Exodus chapter 4. Um, we just got here. It's not time to leave. No, it's not time to leave. We were, we started Exodus last week, and uh, Saturday we were in Exodus chapter 4 in our quiet time reading. Uh, and I, I want to go ahead and read this, even though it's maybe something very familiar to you. It's, it's good to go ahead and hear the 17 verses, so it's a little bit longer. And I know you want to get to your test, but... Um, Let's read the whole chapter. No, we're just going to go to 17. <laughs> Moses said, what if they will not believe me? God has commissioned Moses. I want you to go set my people free. And, and um, God, has, God has laid out the plan. This is what's going to happen. And you... And he's going to do it by compulsion, but he's going to let you go. Then Moses said, what if they will not believe me or listen to me, listen to what I say? For they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. He said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it and it became a staff in his hand. That, the Lord, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. The Lord furthermore said to him, Now, put your hand into your bosom. So he put his hand into his bosom. When he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then he said, Put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand into his bosom again. When he took it out of his bosom, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, they may believe the witness of the last sign. But if they will not believe even these two signs or heed what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile, pour it on the dry ground, and the water which you take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in times past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. But he said, Please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. And the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. And he said, Is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently. And moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth. And I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, he shall speak for you to the people. And he will be as a mouth for you. And you will be as a God to him. You shall take in your hand the staff which, with which you shall perform the signs. Um, maybe you found yourself in that position with Moses, that God has asked you to do something, and you have your excuses. Uh, Lord, what if they don't believe me? So what if they don't believe you? He's saying, go do it. Yeah. Well, what if they don't believe me? Okay, here's the signs. Here's, some people need signs. You know, some people need that stupid sign, and then some people need the sign to help them believe what's true. <laughs> So he goes through that whole thing. Oh, Lord, I'm not real. Uh, who made your mouth? I can, I can make. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll use Aaron. And it's what I saw in that in that process is that that's what discipleship is all about: teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So when the Lord teaches us, then we turn around and teach somebody else, put those words into their mouths, so that they can turn around and teach someone else. And, this is what I wrote for Saturday. I said, we often, or should, identify with Moses' reluctance and sense of inadequacy. It's okay to feel inadequate. Because we are. And our adequacy is in Christ. We use the same excuses. What if they don't believe and listen? I'm not eloquent. I don't want to, if we're honest. The foundational truth is that the vast majority of the time, I, I couldn't think of a single time when it wasn't, but I didn't want to make an absolute statement. So the vast majority of the time, when the Lord speaks to us, He expects, He intends that we speak <clears throat> that word to others. Whether they believe it or not, whether they listen or not, whether we can express it eloquently or not, we need to say it. 
We need to say it out loud. We need to pass it on to someone else. Um, there's a saying in uh, Jack Wordson, I think, was the one who coined this. He says, your quiet time isn't done until you share it. So as you are learning, what you are learning, God is not giving you this just to make you smart. And he is giving it, and it will fill up your heart and soul and strengthen you and do all kinds of things in you. But it's not just for you. It's for other people around we have to be willing to open up our mouth and say it to other people. That's the process of making disciples. And that was even the model here with Moses speaking it to Aaron and Aaron speaking it to them. That we're following that pattern. So that's, I don't know if you realized when you signed up for this, it wasn't just so you could get, it's so that you can get, so you can give. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this. Day. We pray for Jim and Janet as they continue to try to get here, help them not to be frustrated in the midst of the delays and the traffic. And pray, Lord, for Ashley and her needs with her vehicle and the brakes. And pray that as, uh, as we go through the test here now and then the class, that this would be a, a great time for us to learn, to hear your words, to take them to our hearts, to commit to living them out, and to commit to sharing that truth with those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. So your Bible and a 3 by 5 card. So we're done with that. So whatever notes you took on page 51, some of that applies to page 52. When I made that first set, I somehow lost that last page. So we are actually starting on page 53, Pneumatology, Person and Deed of the Spirit. Um, we have three sections. The middle section is not very long. The third section and the third section are pretty long. But uh, this is a great uh, study for a couple of reasons. And one is the relative importance of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. I mean relative to when you live. Uh, in the Apostles' Creed, there's only one article on the Holy Spirit. And that really, in a sense, probably represents the uh, importance that the Holy Spirit had in the early church. It was really not a, a major point of doctrine. Very small uh, statement about the Holy Spirit. But today... The Holy Spirit is a dominant issue. It is, I would say, for many people, the Holy Spirit is seen as a key to the spiritual life. Uh, from tongues to gifts to the charismatic movement to indwelling to uh, conviction to regeneration, and we'll cover all of that. But I mean, for many people today, the Holy Spirit is a much bigger issue than just a minor article as it exists in the Apostles' Creed. So the relative importance is relative to when you live and how important the Holy Spirit is in terms of the way we would uh, view the doctrinal issues surrounding the Holy Spirit. Um, so, its importance in terms of the personality of the Holy Spirit. I think you had a question on the last study guide about that. Uh, why is it important that we uh, look at the personality of the Holy Spirit? See, when it comes to the personality of God the Father or Jesus Christ, it's really not an issue because no one would argue that they're not a person. God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son. But with the Holy Spirit, um, proving or demonstrating that Scripture teaches that the Holy Spirit has a personality is key for two reasons uh, under importance. One, it's essential for proving deity. It is essential that the Holy Spirit have personality to prove deity. And re related to that, the importance of uh, demonstrating the personality of the Holy Spirit is that the personhood of the Holy Spirit is the most questioned of the three members of the Trinity. No one questions the Son's personality or the Father's personality. But for centuries, and even still today, there are some who would question that the Holy Spirit is a person. Go ahead. We're never told to worship the Holy Spirit. That's right. But there are churches that do. There are churches that do. We will cover that okay. issue. We will actually, I, I hope that, and I, I'm not going to deflect your questions, but I've been through the material. 
And I hope that we will cover every question or anything that you have ever heard or thought or been told about the Holy Spirit in the next couple of weeks, in the next couple of classes, okay? And it's there in your notes. You can look ahead now that, now that I finally got those notes. Go ahead. You have something to say? Or, oh. I was just saying, modalistic monarchianism doesn't count as saying that Jesus isn't a person? Um, well, modalistic monarchianism was a heresy. So, yeah, and, uh, you, and that chart that we had last time about reduced, affirmed, denied, the different heresies related to the divine nature and the human nature of Jesus Christ, yeah, there were some that questioned that, but in terms of orthodoxy... Um, okay, so you're saying that orthodox Christians right. don't deny that Jesus is God or uh, Jesus well, yeah. is the Father of you. Right, I would say, but in the history of the church, as we've seen those church councils took hundreds of years, and one of the issues they wrestled with was this one, the person personality, the personhood of the Holy Spirit. So it's important that we, that we look at that. So a theological definition of being, and you're going to notice why being, and I'll talk about that in a minute, a being which has the traits of, and these three issues are important, intellect, sensibility, and will. Intellect, sensibility, and will. We'll look at all of those. But a being that has, which has the traits, and so that is actually a definition, a theological definition of the personality as it applies to the Holy Spirit. And so, let's look first at, uh, uh, and just, oh, oh, that's not good. Um, yeah. Arguments yeah. against personality. Yeah. Arguments against personality. So let's look at the argument that would say the Holy Spirit does not have a personality, all right? And not a bad place to start. The words in Scripture themselves, all right? The definition of the words used for the English word we translate spirit. In the Old Testament, it's the word ruach. In the New Testament, it's the word pneuma. Um, it, both indicate uh, breath, wind, or spirit. But in those words, there is no personality indicated. Uh, really more of an impersonal force. Right? This is one of the arguments against personality. The words used in Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, really do not indicate personality in themselves. Right? Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, sometimes in our Bibles, uh, for the sake of orthodoxy, the, uh, those who have translated our different uh, translations have put he in the place of it. when. It is really the accurate translation in terms of a pronoun applied to a noun, because um, these two words. And, um, and the reason is the gender. The gender of the word uh, ruach is uh, feminine, and the gender of the word pneuma is neuter. Right? In uh, language, there's, there's generally three genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter. Right? And, uh, these grammatical genders do not equate to physical gender. There is no correspondence. We could not make a case for the fact that uh, Ruach being a feminine uh, noun means that the Holy Spirit is a woman. Okay? Nor can we make a case that because Numa is a neuter noun, that it's an it. Those words are not sufficient in themselves. It's really the, the, the gender of words is really just for grammar purposes only. And so this really isn't enough to, to solve the issue. But you need to know that it's one of the arguments that comes to bear here. Um, these words, ruach and pneuma, are word pictures or uh, depictions of the Holy Spirit. But they do not indicate gender in themselves just because one is feminine and one is neuter. Okay? So, that those are the arguments against personality, the words that we have, that we use to, de, de, to uh, translate spirit. Let's look at the other side of this question. The arguments for personality. If in your notes, I would underline against so you know what the argument is, and underline for down toward the bottom of the page so you can make a distinction between these two arguments. The, here, here's the principle. I mean, these are the three words we talked about earlier in the definition, um, attributes and personality. The argument, the biggest argument for the Holy Spirit being a person or having personality is that the, the uh, scriptures demonstrate that the, the Holy Spirit has intellect, sensibility, and will. All right? Uh, we're not going to look up every passage here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 14 is the passage. Well, let's look it up. 
Sorry, I can work it up in this one. If it's okay with you, I tried to see how I'm going to get through this in a, in a timely fashion and decided I'm not going to be able to do it. So we will just cover this and uh, if it means we do not get to a, a comparative survey of religions at the end of this course, then we just don't get to it. I think it's important to cover some of this material. Okay, 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 14. Um, here we go there. Would you read those verses 10 through 14? But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. Okay. Did you pick up on the phrases in there? Three at least. Uh, verse 10, the Spirit searches. Verse 11, the spirit knows. Verse, uh, where was it? A little further. Verse 13, uh, words taught. The spirit teaches. Searches, knows, teaches. All intellectual activity. Okay? An argument for the personality of the Holy Spirit. The one that I, I underlined, which is the one I, I, know, I knew I wanted to look up that one, is sensibility. All right? And if you're a little fuzzy on what that means, turn to Ephesians 4.30. And when you read the passage, you'll know exactly what it means. Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians 4.30. We might, uh, and, uh, and this is the strongest argument of these three, I think, for arguing for the personality of the Holy Spirit because of the word that's used here in uh, Ephesians 4.30. Amanda, would you read that, please? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Okay, obviously the key word there is grieve. What does grieve imply? Emotion. Emotion. Response to a situation that, that brings emotion up in a person. Rocks don't grieve. Wind doesn't grieve. Impersonal objects don't grieve. Persons grieve. It is probably the strongest argument for the personality of the Holy Spirit. But you have to factor in that the Holy Spirit teaches, knows, searches, grieves. Let's look at the third one issue of will. First Corinthians, back to First Corinthians, and this time in chapter 12. These are all uh, passages in the Holy Spirit, and we will get to a lot of these later. We're going to do a whole section on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, so even though this is in that section, we will get to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're going to do uh, a good chunk of a class on uh, speaking in tongues. Right? So, just so you know, we're going to cover all these issues related to the Holy Spirit, and I'm not fast-forwarding by any of them. This is, we're just doing preliminary stuff here. But, attributes, personality, will. 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 11. Tim, you're there. Would you read that, please? But all these work with that one and the self-same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Okay? On the issue of spiritual gifts, we don't get to choose. The Holy Spirit distributes to each one individually just as he wills. There's a lot of truth right in that one verse. Um, and that is, first of all, we could say, it's the Holy Spirit that's in charge of distributing. It's the Holy Spirit who chooses what gift we each get. Every believer has a spiritual gift, it says that, distributing to each one individually. So everyone is given a spiritual gift, and we don't get to choose it. We're not given a list by which I'll take this one, I don't want that one, thank you. No, the Holy Spirit makes that decision because the Holy Spirit, personality, has will and imposes that will on this issue of the distribution of the, of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Go ahead. Um, in order to do that, he would have to have a certain amount of humanity. He the right gift to the right person. 
Uh, yeah, well, I, that is not something that I'm going to present to you, is that the Holy Spirit had two natures. Jesus Christ, okay, the hypostatic union applied to Jesus Christ, the union of a divine and human nature in one person. That's a hypostatic union. You all answered that right. The Holy Spirit says also it can be quenched. Yeah, the Holy Spirit can be quenched. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, so the attributes of personality, those three, that's a big argument. An inanimate object can be quenched. Those three that's a big argument an inanimate object a force, an impersonal whatever, doesn't have those three attributes. That's why this is a strong argument for the personality of the Holy Spirit. But it's not the only argument. Um, let's look at some actions of the Spirit unique to persons. Go ahead, Jim. So, would you, can you define Spirit for us? Spirit? Um, I would go with the definition that you have right at the top. A being which has traits of intellect, sensibility, and will, the third person of the Trinity. No, not Holy Spirit. 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 You mean a spirit being? Mm -hmm. What you're saying is the Holy Spirit is a person, right. not a spirit. I'm not saying just no. a spirit. Holy Spirit, okay, I see what you're saying. I'm getting confused in that terminology. Yeah, um, good question. Uh, I was just doing, I'm obviously having to work ahead here, and I was doing all my notes on angelology, demonology, and Satanology this morning. And uh, we're going to run into that issue. Are demons, yeah, what are they? And I, I would say this. Uh, while they are of the same uh, essence in terms of spirit, in other words, non-material versus material, okay, they are not the same. A demon is not the same as the Holy Spirit, except in the sense that it is an immaterial being. It doesn't have a body. The Holy Spirit is a person without a body. A person without a body. Or can we say the Holy Spirit is a nature? No. Uh, or not. I, I, I just know. looking at I just looking at this this uh, definition of this whole thing. A person is a nature or something added, namely individuality in, in existence. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the Holy Spirit is a nature without a personality? No, no, I'm just, no. I just read the definition of the notes here. Yeah, you're, you're back person you're is, back I just wonder if that, 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 that applies to that. The, the Holy Spirit is a person. What definition are you looking at? Right? He's, looking, he's back in the Hypostatic Union notes a couple pages back. He was covered last Thursday. Uh, 47. 47. Yeah. No. Uh, I'm glad you guys are keeping me honest here. Jesus said the woman's well that God is a spirit must be worshipped in spirit and truth. Yeah. And if he was spirit, spirit saying that, he's saying he's God. Right. Essentially. We're gonna, we're gonna cover that. Uh, but the, I, I think that the discussion here is is there a difference between a spirit being and the Holy Spirit? And the answer is Yes, on this issue of personality, no, in the sense that they're both immaterial beings. Is that, is that okay to say that? A spirit doesn't have a body. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit doesn't have a body either, but they're not the same thing, just because they don't have a body. Right. Other characteristics. Yeah, uh, and we will get that. Uh, you know, the, the demons are not divine in nature. And we'll cover a number of scriptures that demonstrate, I hope conclusively to you, that the Holy Spirit is God. Well, the demons are not God. Evil versus holy. Yeah, and of a different substance altogether. Okay, we just covered um, get back. attributes. And now these are actions of the, the Spirit unique to persons. Now there's a lot here. And I, I, I'm only going to look at the three that I underlined. Uh, I would encourage you, the Holy Spirit teaches. These are things that a person does. Witnesses, guides, we look at convicts, calls for service, intercedes, and send in the service. We'll just look at those three. Um, not because they're, in, but just because for time's sake. Okay, and then we'll take a break after this. So, let's look at the first one, uh, which is in John 16, verses 7 and 8. The Holy Spirit convicts. John 14? John 16. John 16. John 16. Oh, it's the one after. Yeah. Colon. Yeah. John 16. This is one of those passages that I would encourage you to be familiar with. Uh, the first part of John 16. 
So we get to John 16, um, 7 and 8. Uh, actually, I'd go through uh, 11, 7 through 11. John 16, Nathan, why don't you read that? John 16, 7 through 11. Sure. Uh, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I, sorry, but if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I give to the Father, and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. So much right there. Uh, just a comment about the pronouns. Uh, at the end of verse 7, him. At the beginning of verse 8, he. Those are accurate translations of the Greek. Okay. My point earlier was that sometimes when we have the word spirit and then a pronoun corresponding to it in the same verse, in some translations they translate it in the masculine gender. When it actually, when it refers to the word pneuma, it is neuter. Okay. That was my point. There are masculine pronouns, and here's two of them, that refer to the Holy Spirit. Okay? Whatever you mean the same point. You made the same point, yeah. Okay, so, but our point here, actions of the Spirit, verse 7 and 8, um, so the helper, uh, what, what other translations have a different word than helper in verse 7? Counselor. Counselor? Comforter. Comforter, okay. And everybody knows from bibliology, this is the word? Paraclete. Paraclete. Okay, or parakletos, okay? This is the word paraclete, which is a combination of two Greek words. You, ever, you never know what, for, you have to just remember what the two Greek words mean. Para means alongside of. Klete or kaleo means to call, to call alongside of. A helper, a counselor, an encourager, a comforter. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete, the one called alongside, and then a the number of ministries, or works of the Spirit, if you will, specifically for the believer in Jesus Christ, that the one called alongside or comes alongside does in that person's life. All right, and here's one of them. All right, the helper, comforter, uh, it called alongside the paraclete, I will send him to you, verse 8, and when he comes, he will convict the world on three issues, and that's what 9, 10, and 11 are about. Okay, so that is an actions of the Spirit. I mean, convicting is, you know, an impersonal force does not convict people. Convict people is a very impersonal, direct kind of a, an action that one person does to another person. And that's why this is, these kind of activities are uh, unique to persons and therefore uh, are before the personality of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at um, Acts 13.2, which would be the call for service. And then uh, we'll, we'll leave the next last one, which is in the same passage. This is uh, Paul and Silas being set apart for their first missionary journey. Um, so let's read uh, 13, 1 through 4, and that will cover both of these. 13, 1 through 4. Uh, Thomas, go ahead and read that, please. Now in the church that was at the Antioch, there was uh, certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, uh, Simeon, who was called Niger, uh, Lucius of uh, Cyrene. Cyrene, Anaman, who had been uh, brought up with uh, Herod, the, te uh, the tetriarch, and Saul. As he ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Who separate to me Barnabas and Saul? for the work to which I have called him. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, he went down to Seleucia. Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. Okay. Uh, no, no, very interesting language. Because again, the words of scripture are very precise. Verse 2. While they, that would be these four prophets and teachers that are identified, Barnabas, Simeon, Niger, yeah. five, Barnabas, Simeon, no, Simeon, Niger are the same. Barnabas, Simeon, 
Manan and Saul. Okay. And while they're ministering to the Lord and fasting, we should have a discussion about fasting. I don't have that in any of my study notes, but it's a very interesting scriptural process that we have pretty much dropped in the modern disciplines of the church. Clearly, scripture is not optional. Yeah. And I, we miss something by not doing it. Uh, maybe I'll. Uh, since most of you go to the same church, I encourage your pastor to call it fast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we'll probably hit it in Luke eventually here. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Well, yeah. I'll hold him in our church. So yeah. Okay, there you go. Okay, so verse 2. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit spoke. Boy, this, this doesn't sound like a person. Set apart for me two of these four men. You said me two of these guys. Yeah, now there's four of them that were there, but the Holy Spirit chooses two, Barnabas and Saul, and notice the words, for, for the work to which I have called them. All right, that was the point of call for service. All right, and then, then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. It sounds like the apostles sent them away, but notice verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit actually worked through the apostles and if you were in the room, it would look to you like the apostles sent them out, prayed over them, fasted, put their hands on them, called to service. And, uh, but verse 4 tells us that it's the Holy Spirit that sends them out, and then where they went. Started on that first missionary journey. And they were blessed or baptized? Or they laid their baptized. hands on them. Yeah, and, yeah. but the um, implication of laying on of hands mm -hmm. is the transmission of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that, that's a... Uh, oh. What's your background? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious what your theological background is for that statement. I am a uh, middle of the road where I was raised in Episcopalian. Okay, that explains it. But I've been, <laughs> but I've been confirmed in five um, Christian churches. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm kidding you, Thomas. Um, oh, okay. I mean, <laughs> it's your turn. Yeah. <laughs> you think I was a man in this home? No. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Excuse me. Let me just finish this question and I'll get to that. Uh, your statement. Um, underneath your statement that uh, the Holy Spirit, um, let's see if I can remember exactly what you just said. Uh, help me out. Well, the idea Received the Holy Received Spirit. Transmitted the Holy Spirit. Baptism. By laying transmitted by the Spirit. By the yeah, laying on of hands. The, the Holy Spirit was given to them by the laying on of hands. Okay, that, that is a, a variation of sacramentalism. Sacramentalism principally is it's a principal doctrine of, the, of Catholicism. And in sacramentalism, the idea is that through various rituals, uh, men confer uh, or give, actually the, the, the conduit for God's grace to come upon people in a special way. Uh, sometimes in an empowering kind of situation, sometimes just as kind of to mark an event. Um, and, and one of the issues that caused um, Protestant Reformation to separate from Catholicism was the issue of sacramentalism, uh, because the the priesthood of the Catholic Church was they controlled who received these uh, special blessings or empowering or grace giving uh, activity, if you will, through the priest. And one of the issues of the Protestant Reformation was that. Uh, that that whole notion of sacramentalism was rejected in that we don't have to go through a priestly cl class to receive uh, God's empowerment, His grace, His blessing for whatever we're going to do. God gives it directly, not through a designated priestly class. And so part of the issue of sacramentalism, especially, especially within Catholicism, and the reason I kid you about Episcopalianism is that Episcopal is the American version of the Church of England. The Church of England is Catholicism without the Pope. And that grant you right. And so it's, my it's idea, very similar. My idea the was, as you described it, and yeah, that's the origin of it. Right, that, that is the origin of it. Is and the um, same as the Anglican Church? Church Anglican. 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 Anglican Church is the Church of England, and the, the American version of it is the Episcopal Church. And there's high and low Episcopal. Weren't the priests selling those? Oh, yeah, that's it. Well, they were selling indulgences, which is another issue related to purgatory. But there is in First John, mm -hmm. is that it, once we, we don't need priests. Right. 
And if we have the Holy Spirit, we can discern. The Holy Spirit will teach everyone. And the church still holds tradition with people with scripture. Yeah, well, and they're not the only ones, for sure. Um, and, and so, and we're going to run into this, and I, I suppose I should address it right now. Uh, we're going to run into the issue of uh, when you have the teaching of Scripture here and the traditions of a church, or let's just call it the teaching of man, uh, wherever it came from, uh, when those two come into conflict with each other, which one do you suppose is going to come out on top? Well, I think so far we have been taught that the Bible should come out first. Yeah. And, 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 and why do you suppose, I, I agree, but why do you suppose, because we're going to especially get into these issues, it's interesting that as much as any other issue today, see, if we would have been teaching this class in the 5th century, all those uh, heresies that you just, you know, Struggle with on that test, if you know, just historianism and Arianism. Well, that would have been the issue that we would have gone, here's man's tradition, here's what scripture teaches. And we would have struggled over that. But here we are, you know, you know, a millennium and a half later, and the issues we're struggling over with, which which has the upper hand here, it's on the issue of the Holy Spirit. And that's why, as I started out this particular series, the the issues related to the Holy Spirit are much more prominent and and potentially polarizing today in the church than they ever were in the first, uh, first few centuries of the church. It was just not a big issue for them. Today, very much a big issue. And so we, we're going to run into, and probably represent it to some extent here, even in this group, man's traditions versus what the scripture teach. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll share with you what the scriptures teach. And uh, I'll encourage you to, if you're going to have to make a choice, go with that one. But recognizing that it's also going to come up against some traditions that may be difficult to be let go. Okay, go ahead. Just off the top of your head, do you know of any other um, scriptures that says the Holy Spirit spoke? That says the Holy Spirit said? Oh, uh, yeah. Directly like that. Um, let me write myself a note because I cannot put my hand well, on it right know, now. There are, no, there are some. It seemed to me that's the first time I've actually seen that. Didn't he speak to Mary? The angel spoke to me. Yeah, the angel. That, that's not critical. It's it's just the, that is what shows me as a person. Specifically, what the we talk about. talks about whenever, like, quotes Old Testament scripture, it says the Spirit said specifically yeah. right there. Yeah. Well, that's Old Testament. No, 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 no. In the New Testament, yeah. whenever it refers to, it, it, there's a couple of places where okay. it refers to the Old Testament, it says okay. the Spirit said. Well, one of the things that That's fine. we may not get to today is uh, the difference in the Old Testament and New Testament. Um, all right, let's stop right there and let's take a break. It's 8 15. So, uh, sugar up. Sugar up. Sugar Okay, so we just talked about uh, actions of the Spirit unique to persons. Uh, he, here's the next section. It, it, the, 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 the lines of argument are very similar, as you've noticed. We, we dealt with the Father, we're dealing with the Son, we dealt with the Son, we weren't moving on the Holy Spirit, and this is just kind of how I think theologians think, right? Uh, actions received by the Spirit, meaningful only to persons. Obeyed, lied to, obeyed is in um, Acts chapter uh, 10, that's the uh, story of uh, Cornelius. Peter and Cornelius lied to Acts chapter 5, that's when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. And goes that. Let's look at the last one, Hebrews 10 29. Insulted, one we don't usually look at very often in terms of uh, an action received by the Spirit, meaningful only to people. Uh, you don't insult rocks, you don't insult wind. But you can insult the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so, I've insulted a few rocks. I can insult a few rocks. <laughs> you have too. They've insulted your that toes too. Yeah. Okay. Um, so 1029. Look, we need to go back up to 26. though. So, just get the context here. This is on the issue of uh, discipline uh, um, and shrinking back. So uh, let's read 26 through 29. Uh, Jim, Rao, would you read that, please? For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, 
the terrifying expectation of judgment, and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Uh, how much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled under the foot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? Okay. So the last phrase, obviously, the one we're, we're looking at here, but a uh, very strong warning from the uh, writer of the Hebrews. And so you know from your uh, New Testament survey, who's the author of the Hebrews? Oh, yeah, they're all right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Jesus. So, <laughs> the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, insulting the Holy Spirit. So, it, one of three actions received by the Holy Spirit, meaningful only to person. All right? Let's get into the deity of the Holy Spirit. Direct statement. We have to turn to this one. It's one of the strongest statements in the New Testament about the deity of the Holy Spirit. Second Corinthians chapter 3. There's a blank there because I have some other notes to add in there for you. And we will come back to this one. Uh, if you go down a little further down the page, you'll see 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. And we'll pick it up again down there. Uh, so, direct statements of Scripture about the deity of the Holy Spirit. Three, 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. Mitchell, could you read that, please? 16 through 18. Please. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. For we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. Okay. Uh, use of the title Yahweh, or Lord, and... Um, that would be the first point under direct statements. Uh, it's the title, you know, verse 17. The Lord is the Spirit. Uh, and then uh, it down in verse 18, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Your translations might vary, but it's, it's the sense of the translation, no matter what it is, is that the equation between the Spirit and the Lord, the Lord being uh, Yahweh, Kurios. So... Uh, Pretty much a direct statement of scripture in the New Testament. Um, verse 17, the Lord is the Spirit. And then repeats it again in verse 18. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to this in just a minute. You'll see it's a little further down on the page. Associations with other divine members. Uh, Matthew 20, 19, mm -hmm. which would be about the Great Commission. That ties them in the name of? Association with the Father and the Son. Okay, Second uh, Corinthians thirteen fourteen. We don't need to turn there. It's a benediction. You had it on your notes earlier uh, when we were talking about the Trinity. But it is a blessing, a benediction that includes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there's that association with the other members of the Trinity, and uh, we've seen those before. Equations of the Spirit with God. Uh, let's turn to Acts chapter five. <coughs> this is the the one with Ananias and Sapphira. Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land. Didn't it belong to you as it, before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you, th what made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. Alright, so notice verse 3. Why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? Verse 4. You've not lied to men, you've lied to God. That's association, the equation of the Spirit with God. The Spirit is God. You lied to the Holy Spirit, you lied to God. Right? It's a kind of a one-to-one. -one. The Second Samuel 23, 2 and 3, um, you can look it up. Uh, it's uh, the Spirit, 
the Spirit spoke, and in the next verse it parallels the Spirit speaking with the God of Israel speaking. So we have the Spirit speaking, and then the, as often happens in uh, Middle Eastern literature, a restatement of that same issue, only this time instead of calling the Spirit speaking, it's the God of Israel. So it's that, again that equation with uh, the Spirit with God. Um, so I told you we'd come back to the issue of divine titles. Um, that we saw in verse 17 that uh, the divine title was Yahweh or Kyrios. Um, and um, and with the reason we know that it's Yahweh, uh, and um, I should go there again. Turn to 2 Corinthians 3 again. I, we, I didn't show you this in the first time through this, but uh, this, is an, so this is one of those kind of association things uh, of, with the Old Testament. Um, if you notice verse 16, 2 Corinthians 3, 16, uh, notice it says, uh, it's in first, excuse me, 15 and 16. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. Whenever a man turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. What was the name of God revealed to Moses that he spoke to? Uh, Yahweh. Yahweh. And the connection is anchored in the historical tie-in of Moses, Baal, Yahweh. Okay? Even though we're in the New Testament and we're translating that with the word kurios, because of the reference to Moses and the veil, we know that the author here is looking back at that event in the book of Exodus where Yahweh is speaking to Moses and his face shines in with the veil on there. And so when he goes down two verses later, we know that he's equating not just Kurios with spirit, but Yahweh with spirit because of the, the historical tie previously in verses 15 and 16. Because Moses, when he would go in to talk to the Lord, see, would take the veil off. Right. And that's that when he turns to the Lord, right. so there's the tie-in. He turns to the Lord, and he turns to Yahweh. That was the name, if you remember Exodus 3.14, YHWH, that was the name that, that God revealed himself to Moses, and that's who Moses would speak face-to-face -face would be Yahweh. So here we have it by that historical tie-in that um, the divine title of Yahweh is applied to the Spirit. And then verse 18 uh, seems to directly call the Spirit Lord. Just as from the Lord the Spirit at the end of verse 18. All right. Uh, another one is John 14, 16. Let's turn there. Uh, these issues all bear on other things that uh, are very interesting in themselves. But again, divine title. Um, John 14, 16. This this uh, proof uh, pivots again on the precision of Scripture. In the words used, uh, John Huffman, would you read 14:16, please? And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Okay. Again, the word counselor, and some of you have a different word. Okay. Helper, different word. Comforter. Comforter. Okay. We know it's the word Paraclete. All right. One called, called alongside. Okay. Uh, um, so I will ask the Father. Who are we talking about? Father is God the Father, and He will give you another helper. The word another is the key word here, because it is the Greek word alon, A-L-L-O-N, alon, which means another of the same kind. Okay? So it means I'll give you the helper again. I will give you a helper of the same kind, and Jesus is the one who's speaking. All right? I'm going to give you someone of the same kind as me. All right? Jesus is speaking, and he's saying, I'm going to give you another helper of the same kind. There's a different Greek word if he wanted to say another which of a different kind. It would have been the word heteros. And so alan, very specific, precise scripture, again, is another of the same kind. Jesus is speaking, and so he's saying, I'm going to give you another who is just like me, another helper. He will come to spell it. A L L O N. Alan. The word not used that means another of a different kind is the word heteros. Right. Okay? So, again, because of the precision of Scripture, it's an argument uh, by equating the divine title with the Holy Spirit. All right. If you flip the page in your notes, we'll go to some divine works. We're not going to cover a lot of these. Um, again, we're still talking about the deity of the Holy Spirit. 
divine works. We've talked about divine titles, you know. Uh, so, uh, in this first grouping, I only uh, underline inspiration. And I would say for the purpose of, uh, uh, just for your information, should any of this information appear on the quiz, I would only expect you to know one of these, any one you want. If I was to ask, uh, you know, what are some divine works the scripture describes and attributes to the Holy Spirit, pick out creation, incarnation, inspiration, one of those, right? And the same on the next grouping, which is divine attributes. But look, let's look up inspiration, Second Peter chapter 1. First of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. All right. It's actually, well, when we did bibliology last winter, we looked at this verse, and um, that phrase, moved by the Holy Spirit, uh, part of the inspiration process by which the Holy Spirit inspired Scripture through human authors. Again, one in a list of divine works. Uh, only God creates the incarnation, the inspiration. Uh, the incarnation speaks of um, Jesus Christ becoming man. Inspiration of Scripture, regeneration. He must be born again. Sanctification, the work of the Holy Spirit. Those are all divine works. Uh, people can't do those. Demons can't do those. Angels can't do those things. Only God can do those things. All right, those are divine works. Go ahead. Ten minutes earlier, well, the Holy Spirit speaking. Here, the Holy Spirit speaks through men. That's right. Yeah. Well, it does speak human. Okay, on the next list, a similar list, divine attributes. Um, uh, I've got two of them underlined there. But we kind of looked at the, the om omniscience, you know, only the Spirit of God knows the thoughts of a man, all right, that omniscience. How, how can anybody know the thoughts of a man? Well, the Spirit of God knows the thoughts of a man. But let's look at the omnipresence uh, one. Those are all divine attributes, omnipresence, omnipotence, eternality, and omniscience. But uh, let's look at Psalm 139, verse 7. Because the Holy Spirit is everywhere, right? That is a divine attribute. Okay. Um, further on your notes, the Holy Spirit receives human responses belonging to God. Cover the first one. It can be lied to as if to God. Put Acts 5 next to that. We covered that one. Can be obeyed or disobeyed as God. Uh, put Acts 10, verses 19 to 21 next to that. That's the issue of uh, uh, Peter and Cornelius. Uh, the most interesting one is, uh, can be blasphemed, which is from Matthew 12. And we are going to, if you put forward your notes just a little bit to uh, page 58. We will spend a good chunk of time on the God of page 58 on the sin of blasphemy. Okay? So, yes, so just to know we're not going to skip it, it's the bottom half of page 58, we will get there. We're not going to spend time there today. But uh, these are uh, human responses that belong to God. Uh, can be lied to, can be obeyed, disobeyed, can be blasphemed. And um, the interesting thing about the word blaspheme is it, it is unique to God. 
Humans can be insulted. Only God can be blasphemed. Humans cannot be blasphemed by the, the definition of the word. And uh, we will look at that much more closely uh, in, a, in a little bit here. But uh, there's a question that comes right there. Why are, somebody asked this earlier, or responded, why are there no commands or examples to worship or pray to the Holy Spirit? We don't have any of that um, in the New Testament, despite what it happens in some churches. Okay? It speaks of the Holy Spirit assisting us in our prayers, but it never says praise. We, never, we don't have an example of the New Testament believers praising or worshiping the Holy Spirit. No commands to do that either. Or pray to the Holy Spirit. We don't pray to the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, I was just reading uh, in the news today that, uh, you know, it, it sounds to you like I pick on the Catholic Church a lot. It's because you do. I do. <laughs> and, uh, and it's because... What uh, you're familiar uh, with. I, I don't do it out of ignorance. I have, I have a long <laughs> and, uh, and dark history with the Catholic Church. <laughs> but, uh, um, I was reading, uh, they, they've designated uh, six more saints. And... Um, yeah, one was a Native American and uh, Obama. Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> He's got to be dead first. <laughs> dead first Obama. Two Americans. Oh, right. <laughs> so that hasn't happened yet. But um, yeah, but on the issue of praying to the Holy Spirit, what happens with saints is that in the Catholic system, people pray to saints. I mean, but with that, not even just getting into that issue, we don't have an example of being instructed to pray to the Holy Spirit, let alone to a person, a dead person. But nothing to, and so here's the answer. The purpose of the Spirit is to glorify the Son. Um, John 16, 14. The purpose of the Spirit is to glorify the Son. And John 16, 14. And the pattern, we are to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, or in the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. And let's look at that passage. That is in uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. So I, I wrote these ones out for you uh, in your notes. So you can just put the references there, but let's look at Romans 8. We, we looked a lot at Romans 29 through 30 when we were talking about predestination a few weeks. Can you imagine that we've, we've zoomed through predestination? And now we're off into the. <laughs> you guys are doing great here. You would like to be famous. Yeah, that's so awesome. Yeah. There we are. So we're we're going to look at uh, so we're down here under pattern. Pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. And uh, Romans eight twenty five and twenty six. Eight twenty five and twenty six. Romans eight. Um, Janet, would you read that twenty five and twenty six, please? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. All right, and read verse 27 too. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Isn't that an awesome truth? When we don't know how to pray as we should, the Spirit Himself intercedes for us uh, audibly. What does it say? Groaning. Groaning's too deep for words. Did just I think did we talk about this earlier? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, those of you who are uh, that are doing the uh, tongues yeah. issue, uh, as some would point to verse. Uh, 26 as uh, evidence for uh, so speaking in three groanings. Yeah, the three groanings. So, so yeah, it's, it's not. It's a kind of a very bogus. It is a non-argument. I mean, really, it just doesn't bear scrutiny. It's the third of three groanings in here. Creation groans. Um, uh, so you have to say creation speaks in tongues. It, it just doesn't work. That's not the word. So uh, this is not a good proof text for that. But the pattern is here, right? The, the Pray the Father in the name of Jesus, and the Spirit intercedes for us. Basically, the Spirit does what Catholics think Mary does. Yeah, now look at that. See, I, this question got duplicated. I have to change that. Sorry about that. Okay, maybe we'll write that down. Okay. 
All right, um, there's a chart that I put on under here, and I don't think I'm going to quite get to this chart today. I was hoping that I would. All right, um, the distinctiveness of the Spirit. In other words, uh, is the Spirit distinct from the Father and the Son? Right? Um, so we're going to start out with this premise. The Holy Spirit is a full member of the Trinity, co-equal, co-eternal, of the same divine essence, yet distinct. All right, now we covered a lot of this. And I, that's why I have senior notes on the Trinity above. I don't really want to cover that ground again. Um, and so just one further evidence of the, uh, the divinity of the Holy Spirit, uh, co-equal, co-eternal um, part of the Trinity. All right. um, this next section, which is what I've got a chart on, is um, the, the Spirit's activity changes at the cross. And actually, let me say that more accurately, it changes at Pentecost. Um, so we're going to look at the Spirit's activity before Pentecost, and then the next section is the Spirit's activity after Pentecost. And what you will discover is that there are some very clear, distinctive differences between what the Holy Spirit did in people then versus what the Holy Spirit does in people since Pentecost in our day. Very different. And uh, by the time we're done looking at this, I hope that you will rejoice as I was doing uh, earlier, just thinking about this, about just God's mercy that uh, all of us were born on this side of the cross. Because the work of the Holy Spirit is significantly different in our day than it was before Pentecost. So, and here's our introduction statements in your notes. There seems to be a distinction in the Spirit's activity before and after Pentecost. Let's turn to Joel 2:28 and 29. Uh, you probably know that uh, this is one of the passages that was quoted um, by Peter on the day of Pentecost. He quoted this section, Joel 2, 28, 29, and in his first speech on the day of Pentecost, when the tongue of the fire descended. So, um, what was Joel Amos, what was that? Jonah Micah, the name of that church. Zephaniah. 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 You guys know that. <laughs> For you. All right. 228 29. Um, go ahead, Jordan. If you read those two verses, please. It shall come to pass afterwards uh, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants. And upon the handmaids, in those days I will pour out my spirit. Okay, so what we see there, it's right there on the screen. Those verses anticipate something different. Notice the, the language. It will come out after this, at the end of verse 29. And I will pour out my spirit in those days. There's an anticipation of something different uh, going to happen in the spirit's activity among men. So, you know, the Lord prepares us through uh, the, uh, the scriptures. So let's look at the differences. The work of the Spirit in the Old Testament. Uh, this is what the Spirit did. This isn't the difference. This is what the Spirit did. And then we will compare. And I will put this chart up before we're done today so that you can get the chart down and see it all in, in one page. So this is the pre-Pentecost ministry of the Holy Spirit. I'll say this. Difficult to prove this. Uh, easier to see it. Um, if we only had the, new t the Old Testament, it would be difficult to see all of these. With the New Testament, it becomes very clear because the Old Testament um, brings so. I mean, the New Testament brings so much of the Old Testament to light for us. But um, you know, uh, we see the creative work. The Spirit of God was hovering over the, the water, Genesis one two, right? The, the void. So the Spirit of God is there and involved in creation. Psalm one hundred four. Another statement of it, Job twenty six ten. Uh, I, I would encourage you to look these up at your leisure. Um, I wasn't going to spend time looking at these. Um, that, those are verses that speak of the Holy Spirit activity and creation in the Old Testament. All right? That's the work of the whole Holy Spirit. Um, in the issue of revelation, somebody said this earlier, it's probably the most frequent ministry of the Holy Spirit in prophets, in visions, uh, in dreams. The Holy Spirit revealed God's will, God's specific directive will, God's prophetic plan for history. Um, and really, no one disputes this work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was involved in Revelation in a number of instances. All right? 
Um, and somewhat, we could say, regeneration. Uh, John 3.10 is uh, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. Um, and uh, John 3.10, Jesus said, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things about why a man must be born again, born of the Spirit? Right? The, again, hard to prove, but because the Holy Spirit is the agent of regeneration in the New Testament, it's assumed that the Holy Spirit was also the agent of regeneration for those who were became believers in God, saved the children of God in the Old Testament as well. Again, more assumed than demonstrated in the Old Testament text. Uh, but it is usually a work applied to the Holy Spirit. Uh, but the biggest issue here is this issue. This is where we really separate the work of the Holy Spirit from Old Testament to New Testament on the issue of indwelling <coughs> or empowering. And many, many of the questions that we have uh, about what was going on with Saul, you know, how did the, you know, he has the Holy Spirit, now he doesn't have the Holy Spirit. What, what was going on, you know, when all of a sudden, you know, you know, one of the Old Testament figures walking along and the Holy Spirit comes on him and he starts to prophesy with the prophets and then, and then he's not doing it anymore. What was going on? What, what was the Holy Spirit doing in kind of this coming and going activity? And it had, a lot has to do with the distinction between those two words, indwell and empower. I'll give you the short answer right now. We are indwelt since the day of Pentecost. The Old Testament believers were empowered. Very, very different work of the Holy Spirit. And we will try to flesh that out. So, in the Old Testament, terms used of the Spirit's activity through individuals. Um, you'll recognize some of these quotes. We're not going to go to these places, but you'll recognize, in whom is the Spirit? Filled, full of the Spirit in Micah, came upon, literally that means to be clothed, moved, or overpowered, poured out. We just read that in Joel 2.28. The Holy Spirit will be poured out on the sons of men. Entered into from Ezekiel. Those were all terms that we have in our Old Testament that speak of the Spirit's activity in individuals. Interesting group. In whom is, filled, full, came upon. Um, pour it out, enter into, uh, your translations would have different, uh, different, slight differences. Um, still again on the question, does the Spirit indwell or empower? The objects of this activity, for the, the, the purpose of uh, argument, we'll say we haven't determined whether it's indwell or empower, although I'm giving you a heads up what's going on here. But we're still looking at what the Holy Spirit did. Well, who, who did he do it to? Well, he did it to the faithful saints. We would have assumed that. Now, Ezekiel 7, 2. He did it to sinful saints. You probably know from Judges 14 who that is. And Samson. Samson. And Samson. Samson was a sinful man, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson and manifested in superhuman strength. He was the original Hulk. Right? And so, uh, uh, but, so faithful saints, sinful saints, but guess what? Here's, here's a ringer for us. The Holy Spirit also did activity in unrighteous people. And the Numbers uh, 24-2 is a reference to Balaam. The donkey. Balaam and the donkey, right. Balaam was an unrighteous man, and that's not my editorial comment on his character. That's Scripture's comment. He was an unrighteous man. He was not a godly man. He, we will not see Balaam in heaven. But... The Holy Spirit acted in his life. Well, that's kind of a ringer for us. So we have activity of the Holy Spirit in faithful saints. We would have expected that. Sinful saints, okay, we've got that going on today. But in unrighteous people? Yeah, unrighteous people. Well, how long did the Holy Spirit activity last in these, in these Old Testament people's lives? The duration of the activity of the Holy Spirit. Um, man, these are all lined up. Um, let's... Uh, Good, we'll get there. All right, uh, let's look at Psalm 51, the first one, David's example. The uh, duration of the Holy Spirit's activity, and you probably, if you're familiar with the Psalms, you know what, what, what this one is. Take not thy Right? So David's example. So this is a psalm, uh, 
Psalm 32 and Psalm 51 uh, were the Psalms that David wrote after his uh, debacle with uh, Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah, uh, Uriah the Hittite. Hittite? Uriah. 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 Yeah. Uriah. Uh, okay, so down in uh, verse 11, Psalm 51, 11. Uh, go ahead and read that, Jim. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. All right. Which seems to imply what? That he had it. Or that he could. Or he did. Or he could. But it doesn't, you know, and we'll look at the difference when we get to the, the, the post Pentecostal era, which we live in, about the difference here. And this relates to a lot of other issues. But David said, Lord, don't do it. Don't take your Holy Spirit away. Because remember, David lived through the Holy Spirit of Saul. Saul had the Holy Spirit, and then the Lord took the Holy Spirit away from Saul, and he got an evil spirit in his place. So David had evidence. From his own experience with Saul, that the Holy Spirit can be taken away. It could at that time. Did you ever notice where he doesn't say that salvation can be taken away? Yeah. It, but he said, return to me the joy of my salvation. Okay. Not, not return it to me because it can right. be taken away. All right. So the duration of the activity, David says, Lord, don't take the Spirit from me. Let's look at Saul's example, though, in 1 Samuel 16, 14. David prayed that the Lord would not take the Spirit from him. I don't know that he knew he was in grievous sin. And uh, Saul, 1 Samuel 16, 14. Go ahead, Jim, read that. Why don't you look at this? Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and the evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. All right, so in terms of uh, the... Uh, the duration of the activity, we would have to say that uh, within a person's lifetime, the spirit could come or the spirit could go, right? No guarantees here. No, once you got it, you're good to go kind of thing. Um, David is fearful the Lord will take the spirit away from him. Saul had the spirit taken away from him. So certainly a different duration here, shorter. And, uh, so and in, in this, in my... Translation here it has now the spirit capitalized and then the evil spirit small small s. Yeah. So that's yeah. indicating there's two different types. Two different two different types of spirits. And so in, in terms of the purpose of this activity, uh, which you don't have in your notes, um, the conclusion that uh, I come to, <coughs> and, uh, and certainly not the first, is that in the Old Testament the Holy Spirit empowered, not indwelt. Okay. And the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and so this answers the question down here, is this indwelling or empowering? And I would underline empowering and say it's empowering. And the purpose of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was to accomplish the sovereign task of God. All right, that's why the Holy Spirit comes on Saul, he's the first king, and he wins a bunch of battles, but when, Saul's, when Saul begins to run off and do his own thing, the Lord takes the Holy Spirit away. Because the sovereign task for which Saul was, was given the Holy Spirit is over. And so it's more of an empowerment, which is a temporary thing, for a specific activity, a purpose, sovereign, God's sovereign purpose, uh, not indwelt. We'll look a little more at indwelt. Um, but uh, I'm going to do this. On the next page, we're not quite there, but I want you to get this chart. And so if you turn over your uh, notes to the next page, Long time. I'd like you to get this chart down. Uh, you have it on uh, the top of page 57. So, uh, spirit in the Old Testament, spirit in the New Testament. All right. Uh, four works, if you will, of the spirit in the Old Testament. These are we looked at them. This just puts them in a chart form. Creation, revelation. It, revelation, its counterpart in new inspiration. Its inspiration of this first Peter, uh, second Peter, 121. Regeneration assumed, if you remember, but very important in the New Testament. Uh, John chapter 3. You must be born again, born of the Spirit. All right, and then uh, a summary of the difference of empowering in the Old Testament versus indwelling in the New Testament. And uh, so get this chart down, then I won't have to do it next time. So.
a little bit ahead of where we are, but we're just about out of time. You'll notice empowering is temporary, indwelling is permanent. Empowering includes some, but not all, believers, but it also includes non-believers. Whereas indwelling is only to believers and to all believers. Empowering's purpose is for God's sovereign task. We just talked about that. Indwelling's purpose is for personal guidance and the ministering of God to the individual. Very different work of the Holy Spirit. Why do you have inspiration in parentheses? Uh, because that's the New Testament, you know, uh, when we read 2 Peter 1, 21, you know, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, for all scriptures God-breathed or inspired, right? Revelation, you know, the Spirit of God spoke to the prophets, but in the New Testament, um, I mean, after the giving of the, uh, we could actually also put here probably illumination, in terms of working the Holy Spirit, as far as the truth of God's word, I mean, is my junk in the way here, Karen? No, you're fine. Thank you. It would also be the idea of causing us to remember the things that we've been taught. Yeah. That would be that inspiration. So the answer to the question, did the Holy Spirit act differently among people in the Old Testament versus the New Testament? No, it's the same. Yeah. Resounding yes. Very, very different. And uh, not that you'll remember this, but uh, somewhere in your notes you'll have this sometime and uh, hopefully you'll be able to refer back to it. Everybody get all this? Okay, let's, uh, I want to be sure you get that, but I'm just going to take a couple more minutes, and let's just finish the, your notes up to that chart. <coughs> so, um, so uh, with the question at the bottom of page 56, uh, we're still answering the question, does the spirit indwell or empower, and types of empowering, it's right toward the bottom of page 56 where we left off. Um, this is, again, remember, different from uh, the New Testament indwelling. Um, speaks of uh, Moses' leadership in Isaiah 63. We'll go there. Um, in terms of craftsmanship, Bible trivia, what was the name of the craftsman that built most of the objects in the tabernacle? Bezalel. Bezalel, okay? Yeah, okay, so... The Holy Spirit emp empowered Bezalel to have extraordinary ability to, to accomplish that. I remember, for a specific task. That, that's the, the issue of empowering. And then, of course, this is our favorite guy right here. Physical feats. Yeah, Samson, right? Um, to defeat the Philistines. That was the, the purpose of that empowerment, to accomplish that task. And then, uh, the, the interpretation of dreams. Uh, one of the great books of the New Testament. We will actually spend some time. We, we have to get that eschatology. We'll spend some time with Daniel and dreams. And then uh, the prophetic messages that we read about in Ezekiel. All right? And then that uh, takes us to our summary. And we'll stop there. Get up on the next session. Okay, so you have study guide number seven. I think it's number seven to next week. And we will uh, continue on Thursday. Yeah, do Thursday. So if you look in your notes, we only have uh, like a page and a half, and then we will do a short section on pneumatology. And uh, we will start on all the other issues that have to do with tongues, the uh, permanence of the gifts, the gifting of the Holy Spirit, all of those uh, saw mostly under pneumatology three. 
So we will get into that for sure on Thursday. I don't know if we'll finish it, but we will jump in there. Okay? I think we're done for tonight. John Huffman? Dear God, thank you so very much for this uh, wonderful opportunity that each and every one of us has to learn more and more about you. Um, there's a lot, there's an awful lot to, to know, but uh, we just need to open up our hearts to, the, to your spirit to uh, lead us through all the things that you think to give us the ability to remember and to, and to know you better. And that's, that's all we really want to do. We just really want to know you. It's not an intellectual uh, task, but just, just to 